Back when I was working in Colorado, I stayed at a house near a very large golden field. It felt like it had come out of a movie, since I'm from New York and I rarely get to see the horizon like I did back then. There were other things I liked aside from the wide open spaces. Things like how everybody there seemed to be into outdoor activities. But since I was there temporarily, I didn't have a bicycle or a canoe like apparently every car had attached to it over there. One of my work friends had a bike that lent me, and I started by riding around the fields and the houses. It's a different feeling you get just by walking around new neighborhoods with different sidewalks and styles of pretty much everything. One day, after work, I started riding around the block on that old bike, squeaking all around the shady streets. If I went a little ways down the road, I would end up by the edge of the golden fields. Not sure if they were wheat or something else, but they looked amazing with the glowing sunset light in the shade of the nearby mountains. I spent some time just leaning against the bike, watching as a car off into the distance would approach. I lost track of time and the area had started to get dark, so off I went squeaking back to the block where my rental was. As I passed through the streets just before getting to mine, I saw a little boy probably around 10 or 11 years old, waving at me as I passed by. He stepped out into the street behind me, so I stopped and turned around to ask if he needed anything. He waved at me to come join him. I curiously approached as he introduced himself as Benjamin and said that my bike was squeaky. I looked over to his front yard. His own bike was flipped upside down. Apparently he was working on it. I was a little surprised by the outgoing personality of this kid, especially since where I was from, nobody really talked to anybody. But this kid seemed well-mannered, so I introduced myself too. I asked him if he knew what I could do to fix my bike. Then he said to use a certain brand of liquid to enter the wheel into the chain. He said he'd go get it, so he stepped back into his front yard and went to the side of his house. But I stood there for a while. I would say about 10 minutes before I yelled out for Benjamin, but he wouldn't come out. I figured I'd catch him the next day, so I simply got back on my bike, looking back at the house to see if he would come out to the street again. But he didn't. When I got to my house, I locked up the bike and went inside. I passed by that house on my way to work, the house where Benjamin lived, and I would see his bike flipped upside down on the front yard. That same red bicycle and a small milk crate next to it. The one that he used to sit on while he worked. The whole time I was there, I tried to get on the bike to see if I could go on one of those longer bike trails. But my squeaky bike and lack of knowledge on pretty much everything bike repair terrified me. What if I got a flat tire or something else happened while out on the trails? But I still kept going out to the road, sometimes to watch the sunset and other times to find new places to eat or shop around just to kill time, and I forgot all about Benjamin until I saw him again. He was out by the front yard. I waved at him and he waved back, asking if my bike had gotten fixed and where I was going. He said that he knew of a few cool places to ride bikes and to wait for him while he got his stuff. I wanted to tell him that it was okay, that I needed to get back to my home, but he ran off to the side of his house before I could even say a word. So I stayed there, again, for over ten minutes, and I considered leaving and later apologizing for it, until I finally made up my mind and started pedaling away. That's when I heard it. Wait, he said. I heard his voice right behind me. I stopped my bike and looked back before realizing that Benjamin was next to me, laughing and asking where I was going. I told him that I was going home and that it would be getting dark and that he should go home too. That we could ride around some other time. But he just stood there, smiling at me. And then his expression changed. I can't go home, he told me. Now looking down at the ground. Then he started walking back to his house without saying anything else. And I felt terrible. But also, it would have been a little weird for a kid to be out riding bikes with a person he didn't know, and since he was a kid and I was just some stranger. But still, I went home. 
I didn't see Benjamin again until the day when I left that town. I passed by the house sometimes, but his upside-down bicycle would be there without him. I figured I might as well say bye or apologize to him before I left. So with my car all loaded up with everything, the bike now back at my co-worker's house, I pulled up to the sidewalk in front of Benjamin's house and walked up to the door. Maybe I could speak with his parents and maybe warn them to watch out for him a little more. I grew up with the whole don't speak to strangers thing, so maybe it was different there. An older woman opened the door and greeted me, asking how she could help me. But when I told her about Benjamin, she changed her demeanor completely and told me that it was best if I left. I didn't understand, but she angrily pointed at my car and asked me to leave her alone. Margaret, someone said from inside the house. It was a man walking up toward me, greeting me and asking if everything was okay. He was a little nicer and explained something to me that sent goosebumps down my neck. I left the house, thanking the man for his time. The woman had already gone away. My mind wasn't all there when I got back to my car. My arms were shaking as I started up the engine. I looked over to the yard as Benjamin came out from the side of the house, waving at me. I thought back on the man's words about Benjamin. The disappearance. How Benjamin was found. The kid laughed as he came walking up closer toward me, calling my name. But that couldn't be happening. Benjamin wasn't there. Benjamin was dead. He had been dead for decades. I pulled away, feeling disoriented and with the feeling that wouldn't leave me. I looked at the rear view mirror. Benjamin was gone. It was 3 a.m. and someone was tapping on the wall again. This house was loud enough already. I'd wake up whenever anybody went to the bathroom in the middle of the night or opened literally anything from a cabinet to a faucet. The sound squealed and echoed through that house, and aside from putting me in a terrible mood the next morning, I developed a new fear. I used to rent a room in an old house with a few other college students. Nobody knew each other, and it was the start of the year, so things were generally quiet during the day. My parents said it was the house settling that I heard at night, something that I still don't know exactly what it means. The sounds were muffled, like soft scratches through a heavy sweater, combined with that brief moment, like when your earphones get caught on something while you're still wearing them. It doesn't seem like that big of a deal to most people, and though some would simply recommend wearing earplugs and move on, I have to say that imagining something in my ear like that all night would drive me crazy. The room next to mine was empty, though it had been used as a storage area for one of the other girls I moved in, so some of my theories involved rats invading that room, or worse, the walls. And I have to say, it really got to me. I'd wake up in the middle of the night after having some of the most vivid nightmares of my life. And some, I'd see dark eyes coming out from the closet and crawling toward me. The tail of the thing dragging behind the ball of oily black fur. Then I'd wake up, and the scratching would continue, yet I'd be unable to move. At some point, the muffled scratches would go away, but I never found out how they'd leave. Eventually, one of my friends from a journalism class moved into the room next to mine and I was glad to have someone else there that I knew in the house, even just to complain about the noises with, since literally nobody else mentioned how loud that house was, ever. We all just sort of avoided each other. One time, while we weren't in the house, I asked her about the noises and, to my surprise, she said she hadn't actually heard them but then told me something I wasn't expecting. She asked if I had been having nightmares because I would scream in the middle of the night, for no reason, and completely out of nowhere. 
It made me think if people maybe weren't avoiding each other, but instead were simply avoiding me. I felt embarrassed, but most of all, I felt confused about myself screaming. I apologized awkwardly and explained to her that, yeah, I had actually been having nightmares. But I never screamed in them, and that I was very sorry about that. That I was trying to figure out what was happening, too. Even though she didn't hear the scratches, she definitely believed me when I explained to her what they sounded like. And she suggested that we switch rooms one day just to see if she heard them. And so our experiment started, with only a single night out of my room. I slept like a rock, until I heard a faint scream from my bedroom, right through the shared wall. I got up and ran to the hallway and into my room. I turned on the lights, but Hannah was completely ignoring me, staring only at the closet door with her eyes wide open. Hannah, I whispered, wake up. She looked at me, confused. She looked around the room as if trying to figure out where she was for the first time. There's something in here, she said. We stayed up for part of the night, but eventually we both went to Hannah's room and stayed there until morning. We both had voice recorders for our reporting assignments, and Hannah had the unthinkable idea of trying to catch the sounds on tape. It was strange to think about that, recording sounds while you sleep, but it was worth a shot to get to the bottom of the situation. The following night, Hannah brought her blankets to my room and we set up a recorder under the bed, and I placed one close to the wall. At around midnight, we turn off the lights and turn on the recorders. That night, I had the worst nightmare of them all. I looked at my arm and saw a bump over my wrist. I felt around my right arm and soon noticed another bump by my elbow. It was about the size of an M&M sticking out noticeably on my arm. In my dream, I was still right there on my bed and it was dark, but I could feel the bump as I outlined it with my index finger. Suddenly, the bump on my wrist moved up toward my arm and the other one moved toward my hand. I felt a sting on my hand as a dark drop of blood formed right before getting to my ring finger. I was holding back the urge to scratch as my heart sped up feeling that biting sensation grow. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't speak. I couldn't scream. I looked at my other arm as I saw three other bumps parade up and down my arm until I felt another sting near the inside of my elbow. Another spot of dark blood. I wiggled my arms, trying to shake this burning feeling until I finally scratched both of the spots vigorously with my fingernails. They were turning red. Blood was filling up under my nails. But suddenly, everything stopped. I looked down at my arm, and there was a long hair coming out from the bite area. Then it started moving as a second dark hair came out. They moved to feel around the arm as I stared in disbelief. A small head stuck out and then the rest of the body of a dark cockroach showed up. The hair I saw was the antennae of a roach. The other bumps kept moving. A second one came out running from under my skin and up my arm to my neck straight to my ear and crawled inside. I tried to get up, I turned my head and pulled on my ear, afraid of hearing that crunch of a dead roach inside of it. But I recognized that sound. The scratches inside my ear. The muffled sounds of everything around me. I opened my eyes and Hannah was fast asleep. I reached my arm out to wake her up. She drowsily looked over to me as she leaned on her arm to sit up. I hear it. I hear it, she said. The scratching. Get the recorder. Hannah, wait, I said. She turned toward me. A dark little creature poked an antenna out of her ear. And then the second one as it crawled right out into her face right under her eye. Hannah screamed. 
We both stood up, shaking our clothes and hair as two, then three enormous roaches plopped right to the floor and crawled away. We lifted some of the loose boards on the floor and then the closet. The entire area under the floorboards had been infested with roaches, and they later found hundreds more between the walls. I moved out for a couple of weeks while the owner took care of the problem. At least that was the plan. I never went back. <laughs>